Welcome to Six Feet in the Six. I'm your host, Jeff Baer with Business Interiors. Thank you for joining us today. The purpose of this interview series is for the close-knit Toronto commercial real estate industry to share ideas and best practices in order to help everyone get back to the office safely and efficiently. We'll be interviewing leaders from commercial real estate, project management, tier design, commercial end users, and product manufacturers. Joining us today is Joanne Chan, Principal of SDI Design, and Jamie Grossman, Managing Principal of Cresta Toronto. Thank you for joining us. Thanks Thank for you for us having us. Here. Joanne, can you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm an interior designer that practices mainly in Toronto. Um, I'm the principal of SCI Design, as you mentioned. Um, my hobbies, I guess, it's uh, really working in the design field, but also I'm really interested in understanding about the artistic side of our industry. So I do spend quite a bit of time looking into the more um, aspiration elements of our of our world great and jamie can you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself sure um i'm managing principal of cress's toronto office i've been a commercial real estate advisor and broker for the last 21 years focusing 100 percent of my efforts working for the end user being the occupier and uh so i'm very passionate about helping our clients our tenants through everything related to COVID-19 and on the side, I'm a father of two and uh, a struggling uh, professional musician. Musician, okay, great. So Joanne, personally, how are you managing? Uh, I personally hate it. I think I've focalized that in multiple platforms and newsletters and blogs. Um, I find it very challenging in a very collaborative industry, especially with my smaller team. Um, there's a lot of overlapping in terms of idea generation, innovation that happens in a very close-knitted environment. Technology hasn't really solved all the problems. Um, we're making do, and we are making new changes to our process and procedures in order to fit the, the requirement. I bet, yeah. And your line of work collaboration is critical. So I understand the challenges. And Jamie, personally, how are you managing? Uh, do I dare say a little differently than Joanne? <laughs> I've actually come to find a lot of enjoyment out of this. Uh, of course, uh, it's not the, the perfect scenario that any of us are, are dealing with. Uh, but uh, I've really enjoyed catching up on all the lost years of seeing my kids grow up and uh, being close to them. Uh, I think through this process, I've had more meals with my family than I think I had in the first uh, 13 years of their lives. Uh, and we, we can't really uh, beat the weather, at least uh, having gone through this during uh, a beautiful summer versus uh, I don't look forward to continuing it on through fall and the winter. Uh, so I hope we're going uh, through some positive recovery. But, but I've just looked to try to find uh, how we make the best out of the situation. And uh, if nothing else, it's led to a lot of great innovation uh, in terms of the kind of work that we do. So Joanne, can you show us what face masks you've been rocking? It's the generic type, the cloth one. Uh, and the reason why I don't have any branded ones is because I've been offered so many different branded ones, different versions of it. So one of the things I try not to be is uh, a biased designer. So having this is probably the best uh, non-biased tool that I can have. So I've been rocking the normal, you know, paper grade <laughs> face mask. Jamie, right. what face mask have you been rocking? Yeah, so it depends on what kind of mood I'm in. I've been uh, changing it up a little creativity. Um, this is my golf face mask, golf theme based. Um, whenever you're at the golf course, you have to now wear a face mask in the clubhouse. So that's my trusty golf mask. Um, if I'm ever in a warfare situation, I've got some camouflage to uh, work on. Um, I've also learned that I have smaller ears for the size of my face. So the average face mask doesn't seem to work. So I kind of like this guy that you kind of put around your whole head and I'm not even going to try to do that with my headphone. <laughs> but this is my favorite. Custom designed. My, uh, my sister-in-law has been making masks. This is the Toronto Raptors 2019 chap champion Woo! mask. We're hoping that we're going to have to create some 2020 versions of this pretty soon. That's right. So guys, in this season, we have a new segment where we take out our guest LinkedIn accounts and look for posts that need more context. So I'm going to share my screen here. 
So Joanne, seven months ago, you reposted your firm's post highlighting some of the accomplishments that you had in 2019. This is an impressive list. You guys have been yes, busy. Thank you very much. Is there yes, one of these that stand, <laughs> is there one of these that stands out that you're particularly proud of? Um, I think one of the the thing that we really felt that was impactful was the great place to work. Um, as well as the Elevate Awards. So those things come hand in hand. Those are awarded to our studio, not specifically projects. So the Elevate Award was to do with innovation and we were awarded the um, top 50 um, most innovative companies. And funny enough, there was our clients that were in that list as well. So it was double proud because, or triple proud because there was three other um, companies that we designed their space for were on that list. So it's kind of like, wow, not only is our space cool, our client is cool because of us. Um, so that ties into that, you know, moving forward in our sort of 2019 plan that was to relocate our studio to a more of a collaborative environment. And we were able to capture some, um, some really positive energy, not only from an award standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint, our team loves it, and it became sort of our talking points throughout the entire two years. And so it was, uh, it was, it's just so nice that even now I come to the studio, not only because uh, there's air conditioning, um, but it actually, I do feel energized when I come in. It's, it feels good. It feels great. So that's the two things I would say I'm very proud of. Very cool. No, and I agree. I miss your team as well. It's a lot of fun there when I visit. And Jamie found this post. For those of know who do not know, one of my passions <laughs> is playing live music. I've been playing drums since I was about five years old and looks like you had a show February 2020 this year. So tell us about the show. How was it? Yeah, so uh, this is one of my uh, one of my personal outlets is uh, is being a drummer. And uh, as it says, I've been playing since I was about five years old. It's probably one of my greatest loves. It's probably the thing that I miss most uh, during this pandemic is the ability to connect with other musicians and actually create music. Um, I absolutely love performing and usually perform about 12 times a year across Canada. And uh, so I miss it. But that was, uh, the, I guess, the last show we, we put on, uh, about 400 people at the Mod Club. It was a lot of fun. And... Uh, uh, this particular uh, band and project focuses 100% on the Almond Brothers, uh, which is one of my favorite bands and uh, a lot of fun to play their music. Uh, very challenging music to play, uh, but nothing's better than the energy that goes back and forth from performing and an audience and vice versa. So I really do miss it. That could have been the last concert in Toronto too. <laughs> it's pretty close if you, if you look back at the date it's pretty close in terms of when it was from a timing perspective joanne can you tell us about some of the projects that you've been involved in and how they've changed course over the past couple of months so we have clients that are as i mentioned earlier that are very keen on the protocols and procedure of making sure that the safe safety of their team members. So there are clients that are saying, you know what, let's eliminate the occupants of growth. So just house the current staff count in the square footage we have, and then allow for extreme social distancing. So not only are we doing uh, design from a COVID planning standpoint, but we're able to say, okay, you could be resilient now. So from a financial planning perspective, they don't have to go in and spend all the money on the furniture that we're going to buy, number one. Number two is that we're going to allow the opportunity for flexibility in the future. So we buy ourselves a year or two from the vaccine, pre-vaccine and post-vaccine. And thirdly, we're able to re-engineer the conversation and allow the team to come back in feeling very much the safety is, you know, in their forefront in their mind. You know, I know your firm is, is big proponents of activity-based design, and, and we've had a lot of conversations about that over the years. Uh, I think that's something that's really unique is we don't need to throw out all of those methodologies. Reality is there's just a new activity and there's a new setting. It's called the home office. 
And just like yeah. we help people identify the activities that are taking place in their office, now we can identify the ones that are better suited to be done at home and the ones that are better suited for the office. So you're right, we're just kind of, you know, pivoting a little on all the things that we've already talked about before just to accommodate this, this different setting. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to add something though to, to that theme. Um, much of the technology that we're using today existed pre COVID-19. Um, uh, we have had this kind of lightning rod that has forced us to use the technology, start working from home. Um, in the Crescent world, we call this workplace 2.0, which really is what you just said is the, is the redefinition of, of a place to include the home and activity to, to also change in terms of the way that we can do what we do. Um, there's still a long way to go on culture um, and how organizations and leaders around business will change or will they change in which to adapt to this world for the long term. And uh, I do think you're going to see uh, many companies um, draw a line in the sand in terms of whether or not they're a fully virtual company, a fully office company, or really a hybrid in the middle. Jamie, what are some of the new requests you've gotten from your clients? Some of the new requests have really been a response to uh, learning about how landlords are already making changes to leases and, and being caught off guard potentially. So um, the average lease is now including language around uh, landlords being able to apply the costs of uh, planning and initiating future emergency planning for buildings back to tenants as part of operating costs. Well, of course, the average tenant would like to see that excluded or managed, so uh, we can uh, we can we we need to do that. Um, most tenants have have had a long-standing desire for greater flexibility. We all know that the cost of construction and the disruption around a relocation. Uh, is not going away, especially in the GTA, the cost of building is very, very high. And um, now we're trying to manage through flexibility of space for the future with the high cost and investment that it takes to actually build and furnish and design space. Really the, the big ask is, can I spend less on my real estate? Can I get more flexibility out of my real estate? And can I curate and build great space that makes people want to come to the space to be together, but at the same time, doesn't require them to come to the space to be productive. So landlords are sneaking in new clauses that you guys are capturing and, and, and trying to get rid of. That's interesting. Uh, I do have a couple of landlords coming up on the show in the, in the next month. Uh, so I'm curious to get their opinions, but I'm told that a lot of landlords didn't really embrace any of the government programs just because they were really vague and, and confusing and, uh, you know, they're very risk adverse type companies. So what are the landlords like these days? Yeah. So, so remember you are talking to somebody who is about as pro tenant as you're ever going to find. Um, so, so I, I say this, uh, with a lot of respect for, for landlords who have dealt with, uh, these situations. Um, just like tenants who went through mass crisis when this began, so did landlords. I know landlords were working really hard to figure out how to make their building safe and what's the right thing to do. But they, most landlords started the process uh, from the perspective of let's see and wait, right? They wanted to act slower in terms of not making a misstep. So, you know, trying to encourage as many companies as possible to continue to pay rent if they could pay rent. Um, not jumping at, at solutions where, where tenants needed the help and support right away because they could see it, they're running their businesses, landlords are running businesses as well. Uh, I would say that for the most part, um, many landlords who were standoffish from the beginning have started to uh, embrace better forms of partnerships with their tenants now that they recognize that this isn't going away. Uh, it's not perfect because the investors and owners of real estate expect returns. Um, but many landlords who originally came out uh, 
when the government support programs came and said, I don't think I want to participate in that. I can't afford to give all my qualifying tenants a 25% reduction. Most of those landlords have come to realize that I can't afford not to help these tenants and be the difference or be that last, that last straw that broke the camel's back that pushes these companies into never paying their rent again. And Cressa being a tenant specific representation, you know, you being landlord agnostic during this time must be very valuable to your clients who, who put that trust in you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's conflicts of interest exist in real estate. They still do. Um, they're not going away. If anything, they've been heightened, right? Because if you've made your living advocating and protecting landlords, um, you can give them counsel all day long. But if there's no demand on the tenant side, you basically are somewhat functionally obsolescent right now. Um, and so, you know, we've seen, I, I've seen even landlord brokers trying to enter the tenant markets. This isn't like something you dabble in. You know, this is, this is our life's work by helping tenants. And um, the role of a strong real estate advisor isn't to be a matchmaker who's just trying to convince a landlord and tenant to agree to a deal. Right now, Tenants need people who understand their legal rights, uh, who will fight and advocate and support them through this, um, because these are going to be trying and, and very tough times. And, you know, if you're overpaying for rent or overpaying for space that you don't need, or better yet, if your revenues have gone down 25%, 30%, 70%, and, and I guess here's the big problem. The government program only really helps you if you're down 70%. I can tell you every tenant who's down 25% and 30% and 45%, they're finding it just as hard to deal with their continued rent obligations, not to mention the fact that if they're not using their space at all, just sitting and paying that rent until they go bankrupt doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Joanne, what types of programs or services have you launched over the past couple of months in response to this crisis? Um, we haven't done anything different, I guess, from a consultant point of view. We are still people that help people design space and design space. So I would say we came about a different we came about it a different approach. Instead of saying we're offering a new service, we have always advocate care in our approach on design. So what we've been doing instead of saying, hey we're gonna can we COVID plan your space? <laughs> like that's really what people are saying. Uh, is that how how can we help you to go through this together? That's number one. Number two is um, we've also started talking to our clients, not necessarily about COVID, but about how they're mentally surviving in the wellness, uh, in their approach of wellness and mental wellness of their team members, as well as their wellness and within the office environment. If the equation was to have less and do more, what should be less and what should be more? So the conversation we have with people were not only having less to do more, but actually demolishing less and do more. So there's a lot of those conversations people are saying, well, you know, oh, in the past, we would just rip this all apart and do it all over again. So great. That was always been like the last decade, there was like 90% of those clients and then there's 10% that are more very, fairly, you know, environmentally and financially conscious. So they save as much as they could. Now, because they need to do less with more, do more with less, they're now saying, can we take 100% advantage of certain things? Can we reevaluate our strategy 100% not to spend another half a million, a million, two million dollars on reinventing the same ceiling system, reinventing the same acoustic system, reinventing the same, everything was the same. So I guess it has tasked us as designer to not only to be creative in a aesthetic viewpoint or a storytelling viewpoint or a cultural viewpoint, but also a very large sustainability conversation. One thing I've always admired about SDI and Cressa is the partnership that you have and being able to put a lot of different minds around a table to help solve client problems. Um, Jamie, how, how important do you feel the intersection, intersection between uh, real estate and design is during this time? 
uh, it is of monumental importance. Um, I believe it's of monumental importance at, at most times because um, the most expensive space that you'll ever lease, I don't care how good your deal is, if you don't need it or it doesn't have a return on the performance of your organization, it's a wasted investment. Um, and so uh, early on getting it right in terms of uh, where your organization's going and then how you're going to plan it and how it's going to work and how the experience is going to be for a tenant needs to be determined and strategized before you even start to consider where should I be located and seeing space. When you do it the reverse, then often we find implementation fails because you're, you've started with a pallet or a piece of space that can never meet the main objectives that you had in the program. So today as organizations are thinking about what the experience of space is gonna be going forward, working together as a team to plan and think about space and also determine where to go and how are we going to design it and how are we going to construct it and how are we going to structure the agreement with the landlord. I mean, also now more than ever is about strong partnerships between landlords and tenants. Well, understanding tenant need also allows you to not just search out for the right building, but search out for the right landlord, the right partner. And, you know, if, if, if one thing we're going to learn through this is we're going to give a lot of thought to, you know, which landlords truly were strong partners with their paying customers being tenants and which ones really had them fight for any participation or support through this. Jamie used to say that brokers and project managers never get hugs, only designers does. And now after, you know, so many years together, the brokers actually get some hugs, come hugs, and the project managers do get hugs. We have shifted the conversation from being business oriented to human oriented. So it's all about the people. And it's like a little heart that we, we actually do our presentation and we actually put a heart. Yeah. I love, I love Joanne. Asian. I love Joanne's tagline design for humans. Um, cause it's, it's really true. Uh, this is about the human experience. Um, this is about, uh, creating, uh, environments that, uh, bring the best out of people, you know, ourselves included, but so many of our clients spend at least pre this spent a crazy amount of time away from their houses, away from their families in the workplace. And if we can continue to help for the time that people do spend in their workspace to create environments um, that allow them to go home happier and productive and feel value in their lives. And I think we've, we've done more than just design space or broker great deals. We've done our small part in making the world better and, and really helping people. And, and that's what we help for. That's what we hope for. That's where our real pride comes from. And, uh, and it's nice, it's nice to know that your work matters. It's nice to know that, uh, people appreciate you for uh, for your contribution and that they trust you enough to have them part of their uh, key team. Furniture is a part of it. We all know that. <laughs> That's a big part of that conversation, <laughs> Just too. It's okay. No, I, I hey, listen, I've loved uh, learning about your guys' company over the years and you know, you've, you've made it very clear, like so many consultants, we're all trying to make money off of the transaction, right? When that, that new lease commences, that's where we all spend our time, where Crescent and SDI truly look at the life of the lease. And, you know, where can we add value throughout the duration of that lease? And, and you know, your clients already think of that of you. And that's why they trust you today as well, versus, you know, probably a lot of other people out there that are just trying to renegotiate the lease just to get a, a new commission when <clears throat> that might not be the, the best path for that tenant. Well, one thing we've learned through this process, and I hope that everybody recognizes is that leases have start dates and they have end dates. Uh, but it really is the experience through those five or seven or 10 years that truly matter. So on each show we review a product and today we're going to look at co-working spaces. Not one company or space in particular, but the product in general. Over the past 10 years, they've seen a massive growth and kind of the impact of co-working spaces on commercial real estate has been a hot topic for years. Some of the intent of these spaces was for smaller companies to have office space that they can sign short-term leases and don't need to worry about designing and furnishing the space. 
there were a lot of great networking opportunities for those smaller companies as well. Some of the larger companies use co-working as swing space to accommodate a new influx of business, execute a project, or just temporary space to get through a certain business cycle. So there's a lot of reasons why these spaces exist and, and why they've grown in popularity over the years. Now, like every other office on the planet, they're, they're rethinking their strategy and, and the uses for their product. So Jamie, I thought I'd start with you. Uh, maybe, can you just comment on co-working, you know, as it relates today and what maybe you see the future of co-working would be? Sure, so co-working wasn't new as it was rising. Um, it's, it's, it's look and feel was different, but co-working has been around for a very long time for all the reasons that you suggested. Um, they were becoming a, a greater dominating force and user of real estate or, or lesser of real estate over the last number of years. Uh, that has also had a dramatic impact on market rates as you've gone, you know, because now tenants who were competing to find their own space were also competing with co-working organizations who were third party letters who were driving up real estate costs. You know, as you mentioned, one of the, one of the reasons for co-working was flexibility. And uh, many tenants who would enter into co-working arrangements um, would get a better price the longer the commitment that they made. Um, but the downside, of course, of the co-working uh, model is that when tenants are going to try to get themselves out of space, they're gonna get themselves out of the most flexible space that they've, they've let, which is usually the co-working spaces. So, you know, for a lot of co-working operators, this has been a, a fairly tough ride right because they're they do get a premium for their space but you know they still need to be receiving rent and the co-working companies have been in pretty tough in terms of not losing tenants who no longer could break leases or or, or lose space there joanne i mean that leads me to the next question i mean what about the design of these spaces you know they've the the, the kind of traditional the small business that jamie's referring to it, it was meant to be a fun a networking opportunity and, and a lot of close quarters, shared, shared things, shared tools, um, shared spaces. So what do you think kind of the design of these spaces may evolve to over time? So I still believe that that third place concept from transferring from Starbucks to co-working is still very valid. There's a lot of um, opportunities that we tend to consider ourselves in a bubble, um, but people are, if, you know, if we had an opportunity in about four or five months time, would Starbucks still be the third place? place? Probably. So um, I don't think the, the co-working design philosophy is wrong. Co-working spaces, it, it's a toss up. I mean, I, I feel bad sometimes asking guests on this show to predict the future because, you know, the world, it's just opinions and, and there's really not enough information out there for us to have solid answers right now. But uh, you know, one thing I've always liked about co-working spaces is they offered a different experience. And whether you are a big company or a small company, we've all wanted to go check it out. Like I've, I've, I put my inquiry in there and I felt like doing a couple of days down there just to experience it. And so there's still a big opportunity for them to have a different experience that might just be more of maybe it's a healthcare experience, right? Like maybe it's the, the cleanest office out there or it has all the protocols possible and that's what you need and that's what's going to draw you to it versus a, a flexibility conversation so um it's a it's a it's fascinating how fast it grew and how fast it's going to have to pivot now to to figure out what their future holds there's going to be a lot to learn traditional office will learn a lot from co-working co-working will learn a lot from traditional office and one thing that gives me hope is a lot of the first big users of co-working spaces were people who could have chosen to work from home, who actually preferred not to work from home because they desired a sense of community and innovation and being around other human beings and creative minds. And I believe it's going to be that spirit, which also is driving why people want to spend some of their time being part of an office, being part of a company, being part of a community. So, you know, if there's, if there's something to take from co-working to me, it's hope that the office world is in no way dead. Joanne, is there anything else that you want the six to know about you or SDI design and how you're joining the fight against COVID-19? So my, my uh, message, my public message to everybody is if you have an idea and you want to talk about it, call me 
call my team, share it. We'll share it together. We'll we'll build on each other's ideas together. Don't be afraid to uh, to join the fight to uh, fight COVID and the pandemic together. That will be my public message. Nice. And Jamie? thank you. Yeah, I I would say that our our company today is very different than you know what our company was when we started it 30 years ago. Uh, we've seen dramatic growth and, and shift in in our services. Um, it's usually been something outside in the environment that caused that change, uh, that evolution. Uh, it's never easy, but uh, I'm hoping and I, I welcome similar conversations. Anybody who wants to collaborate on ideas. But even more so, if there's some people who are passionate about changing what they're doing with their lives and they want to talk about coming and joining our team or bringing their businesses into our team, uh, we're always open to having those conversations, especially if somebody is truly passionate about helping uh, tenants and occupiers determine what they want to do from a real estate strategy perspective, negotiating space, or even on the design and the construction of space. So we're open for business. We're not going anywhere and we'd love to talk. Well, thank you guys for sharing how your firms are joining the fight against COVID-19. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank you. you very much for having us. Toronto, you are the best city in the world, and we can't wait for you to feel better. Aww. Um. Giant jug of water. Part of my wellness plan. This is uh, eight bottles of water all in uh, in one bottle. Um, I usually get through almost uh, one and a half of these a day. And it actually tells you wow. by, the, by the time. It's a, actually pretty cool. So I'm supposed to be here by three o'clock. So I'm, I'm working towards it. <laughs>